Yeah, I bought my first bike to do a triathlon when I was living in London and I dabbled in that sport for a short period of time, but never really seriously or competitively and did enjoy cycling, but it wasn't, I guess, until I returned to Australia. In fact, not even really until after I'd done the walk and started to form this idea that maybe I could cross the second half of Australia on two wheels, which was going to be much quicker than two feet. I started training maybe in, oh, I want to say maybe in March, and I think I might have, the, maybe the longest ride I'd done prior to that was 40k, because that was what I had to do in a triathlon back in 2010. <laughs> Welcome to the Seat Travel Ride podcast, where we share the stories and experiences of people who have undertaken amazing adventures by bike. Whether it's crossing state borders, mountain ranges, countries or continents, we want to share that spirit of adventuring on two wheels with our listeners. Hello, I'm your host, Bella Malloy, and I'm very excited to introduce my guest for today's episode of Seek Travel Ride, Emma Williams. In July this year, Emma set off on a bicycle tour which would take her from Alice Springs in the very centre of Australia to Alexandra Headland on the Queensland Sunshine Coast. Emma called this adventure the Alice to Alex ride, and during the trip she would cycle over the red dirt of central Australia through vast open countryside, taking in the wide open vistas of the landscape. This also provided Emma with the opportunity to draw on her own personal connection to the country she was travelling in, gaining a perspective of her family history as she cycled. I'm really looking forward to getting to the details of this bicycle adventure with Emma and discovering more about this unique traverse across Australia. Emma, welcome to the show. Thank you, Bella. Lovely to meet you. (laughs) I'm really excited to chat with you today, Emma. I've had the joy of going through the details of your trip day by day and seeing the lovely photos and some of the videos that you posted on your trip as well. And I know that we're going to have some great tales of adventure, beautiful discussion to be had through that. But a question that I like to start my show with, and I ask this of all my guests, is do you remember the very first bike you ever rode? Honestly, Bella, I do not remember the very first bike that I rode. I remember riding my sister's bike when I was probably about eight years old. It was a beautiful blue bike and had these really tall handlebars. And I think karma got me because I fell off that. Got a little bit of a, a scratch on my, my face. But the first bike that I owned, I, it, was, it was a mountain bike and I was probably about 14. And I also remember falling off that and breaking my arm. Oh, no. Was it a really bad break? No, it was the top of my humerus, so it just required a sling. There was no cast. It was just a little bit awkward for however long it took that to heal. But crashing is sort of something that's a similar memory for both bike rides there. Yeah. Which isn't ideal, and hopefully you haven't had many crashes on your bike since. Um, No, no, I've been fairly lucky. I do recall an incident in London when I went over the handlebars of my fixed gear bike, but... That's another story for another day. (laughs) Oh, wow, you've ridden fixed. So this is something that I've never done. I've always been intrigued about riding fixed. So, and I have no idea how it would go. So you went over the handlebars. Was that due to it being a fixed bike or was it just the circumstances? What happened in that instance? It was definitely the circumstances. So my commuter in London was a fixed gear bike. Pinky Blue is what his name is. Beautiful, beautiful old steel frame of Roberts. And... Yeah, unfortunately, on the fixed gear, your brakes are basically your pedals. But I also had a front brake on it and a car pulled out in front of me. And to avoid hitting a car, I needed to stop rather quickly, touch my front brakes to the very slightest amount of pressure. But over I went. So, of course, being in London, there was a pub right across the road. So people were like, oh, my God, do you want me to call you an ambulance? Because I was bleeding from my chin the typical injury you get when you go over your handlebars. I'm like, no, no, it's fine. I'm only 2K down the road. So I just walked home. I did ask for some ice, put some ice on it, walked on home. And then when I looked in the mirror, I realized I needed stitches. So I caught a taxi to the local ED and then left my boss a message at about 2 a.m. and said, I'll be in sometime today, (laughs) just maybe not at uh, 8 a.m. 
fixed the handlebars and cycled back on into work the next day. That is a story and a half. And yeah, I can just, I had this vision of you doing that Superman off the bars, but also <laughs> something on the underside of your chin, which isn't pleasant. I must ask, because you are a paramedic, is that, that's correct, isn't it? That is correct, Bella. Yes, in the daytime, I paramedic, nighttime as well. <laughs> So I guess you have experiences of attending certain accidents and stuff and putting people back together or helping them get on their way as well. I guess that's a really trivial way of putting what you do because I'm sure you attach some pretty high intense trauma incidences as well. But were you a paramedic in London? No, no, I was not. I was actually uh, working for the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade at our Australian High Commission in London. So that was my former career before I decided to become a paramedic and return to Australia to go back to university as a mature age student. <laughs> Not go back to, it was my first time of going to university as a mature age student, sorry. <laughs> I feel there's a benefit of actually going back into some sort of education when we're older as well. Maybe my perspective was wrong on this, but I feel that our reasons to go back and to educate ourselves in this way we're more aligned with what we want to do as well. We have a bit more of a clue, but we're more motivated to actually learn as well. So that's a real tangent from Bicycle Adventures, but that's my own personal input into that type of things as well. So, okay, Bicycle Adventures, let's move away from crashes and talk about excitement. But before we get into your bike travel, can you talk to me a little bit about yourself and the outdoors? Like, are you an outdoorsy person? We've talked about a previous career that was in a corporate world. You're a paramedic, which sees you in the environment that you're in. But how does the outdoors feature in your life? I wonder if I could just do one thing before we kick on off on the big questions, and I'll absolutely answer that, Bella. But I would just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians across the different lands throughout Australia, and I recognise their continuing connection to land, waters, wind, and community. I honour and value the contribution of our elders past and present and the importance of sharing their cultures, tradition, knowledge and ongoing journeys to shape our future elders. In particular, I want to thank my Waka Waka elders for undertaking the challenges they have to provide us with the opportunities that we have today. And the great outdoors wouldn't be here without our ancestors. 60,000 years worth of culture history in this country. And having them being the custodians of our outdoors lets us all enjoy the beauty of Australia. And I think that connection for me probably wasn't in my younger years, but definitely feeling a call to come home from living internationally in the UK gave me a greater appreciation of what we have here in Australia with regards to the beaches, the diversity of our landscapes, the mountains the oceans, the lakes, the rivers, our wildlife. And it's so unique. We're just, we're not like any other country in the world, really. You were spot on. And can I say, as an Aussie who's been living overseas for a while now, just even hearing that sort of acknowledgement of country, really, it actually gives me goosebumps. I love hearing it. And I love, I also love the anecdote where you sort of said that it's taken you going away from your country to sort of feel that deeper connection and, and to search for that connection yourself as well. And I'm sure part of this tour that you took, there were reasons you rode this tour which were not connected to family connections or, or country and stuff, and you did fundraise for some charities as well. But I feel that there was a real deep connection for you as well to sort of, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's search for or seek, but maybe to gain a better understanding about your connections to country from a family perspective as well. Yeah, absolutely, Bella. So I grew up in Rockhampton which is where my, my family ended up. Um, but I am Aboriginal on my father's side. My grandmother, Maureen Williams, she grew up on Waka Waka country near Gangda and Ainsfold. And my grandfather was a Gungari man, which is from up north in Queensland. And I had never, I guess, lived on Waka Waka country. I haven't had a traditional sort of upbringing with regards to that. I was brought up pretty much Western way, put through a, a schooling system. I didn't really finish that journey or that part of the journey, so I never had a grade 10 certificate. And um, just knowing the history from my, um, my grandparents' side, and they had seven children and had the foresight. Grandmother was a, a domestic working on a station, and my, my grandfather was a stockman. They met, fell in love and started a family, but they lived in a tent for the first three children that they had, and 
This is only one generation ago. So they knew early on how important an education was, but unfortunately, I guess the era they were living in, um, education wasn't always accessible for Aboriginal people. And they were very fortunate to be able to obtain some scholarships for some of their children to attend boarding schools and all of their children received a high school education. Five out of seven of them went on to obtain a tertiary qualification. My uncle was the, we believe, the first black fellow that graduated from Central Queensland University only in 1988. So that's only one generation ago. But it was, I guess, the the driving force behind me then sort of coming back to go to university was that I needed to make grandma proud. She had worked so hard to give the opportunity to my aunties and uncles that it was, you know, that driving force to, yeah, come back from overseas and, yeah, get a piece of paper to tell the world that I could do something. (laughs) Emma, just listening to that story, and you point out something that's actually really important here in this broader conversation that goes on here when we're talking about discriminatory sort of settings and stuff as well. Is it? history that you're speaking of is very recent we're talking we're not talking about you know 1788 and first landing no. Australians to Australia and the first preceding century of that we are talking about something that was going on when when you know just a generation ago and certainly foresight of your grandmother to realize education is a way forward for this and and to give her family opportunities which she missed out on But there is a lot of adversity to go through for you to even get to that level as well. You hinted there that you didn't make it through to year 10. And it is a sad statistic for Indigenous Australians as well Mm. that I'm aware of too, that there is an extra struggle to get all the way through the education system, not even speaking about university terms. Was your grandfather, you said, was the first Indigenous Australian to graduate from university in Queensland? It was my uncle, Uncle Kevin Williams. Yeah, so he graduated from Central Queensland University with a Bachelor of Arts. But yes, it's that connection to country. Like I didn't, um, I left home quite young as well and didn't, I guess, have that upbringing on country that I know really connected my grandparents, my aunties and uncles. And knowing, I guess, what they faced as a result of, you know, having to live in the tent on the station grounds, but were a fair way from the station house. I wanted to be able to, as part of my journey, travel through the area that they lived and grew up. And it was it was really special to be able to connect in my own way. I haven't been able to, I guess, connect culturally to that country and the traditional custodians out there just because it's sort of that, that one removed in my, I guess, short history here. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm I'm explaining that with enough depth or detail. <laughs> I'm getting goosebumps hearing about this. It's interesting. I recently interviewed a guest, Mackenzie Barney, and, and she cycled all the way around the world on a little trip. And we talked actually extensively during my session with her about the motivations for people to take journeys and whatever length mm. that is, what the deeper connection is to that journey. And whether someone's at a point in time where they're seeking something, maybe they're seeking answers to a future. But by listening to you there, Emma, you're very much talking about taking a journey which will help give you answers to your own past in a way and your family connections, your own connection to a country that I guess in a way you've you've grown up knowing that this is a strong cultural link for you, but it's unfamiliar and you are looking, seeking to gain some more perspective and familiarity on it. Absolutely, absolutely. And there were some very special places along that journey that, yeah, I, I connected to and took time to to sit and take in the landscape and just have so much gratitude for being able to be on a bike there free as anything with no questions and just enjoy that moment Eidsvold station and Ban Ban Springs where I know my my great grandfather that's where they were were from and just, yeah, there was, there was a lot of tears during some of those times, just being a little bit overwhelmed that I was actually able to be there. And 
to have that sense of accomplishment that I've actually also brought myself here <laughs> on my two wheels, on my pushy, <laughs> with all of my gear. Yeah, it was pretty special. It's a, like a really grounding sense of pride to have, actually, when you when you put it that way. And I realise I've said this now three times, but I've just gotten goosebumps again. So um, <laughs> I feel that this is, this is going to be the trajectory of this conversation as we get into the details of that moment. So the outdoors for you wasn't something that you felt super connected to growing up, but obviously in more recent years, it's something that you have really immersed yourself in. Would I be fair to put it that way? Absolutely, Bella. And I think it comes from, again, the transition from living overseas and coming back to Australia. Overseas, you know, the training was in gyms. I I was a netballer. So you're most often predominantly training indoors, playing indoors. There was a lot of outdoor netball as well, but the conscious decision when I came back to Australia was I have such a beautiful backyard. I'm not going to be training in a gym pretty much ever again. It just wasn't for me. I wanted to be outside. I wanted to be running, swimming, cycling, hiking, just doing as much as I could in our beautiful outdoors. It, it seemed it seemed silly to go and lock myself in, inside somewhere when I was able to do everything I wanted to do outside and Appreciate the the sunrises that you see every morning over the ocean when you run along the Esplanade here on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, Yeah, it wasn't really a a question. (laughs) And can I just say, you have an incredible area to call your backyard as well. The Sunshine Coast or the Sunny Coast, as we affectionately call it as Aussies, is, is a beautiful, beautiful part. The beaches and the coastline there are phenomenal. Obviously, it's called Sunshine Coast for a reason because you get some beautiful weather as well, some big summer storms too. But also then just the countryside, as soon as you move away from the coast, you've got that beautiful rolling sort of terrain there as well, which is absolutely mega. I'm I'm thinking I grew up actually not too, well, not too far away as the crow flies. I grew up in Toowoomba, so in southeast Queensland as well, and not quite east. We were a little bit inland. We weren't on the coast, but I do remember growing up and taking, you know, small weekends or day trips with family to that area of Australia, and it's it's a beautiful place to be outdoors in. Absolutely. Um, Beautiful cubby cubby country where I'm really lucky to be a guest and live and work. All of our beach area here on the Sunshine Coast and it's absolutely magnificent. We are blessed that the um, surf does get a little bit hairy during those summer storm times. But when we move into Jinnaburra country where we have our glasshouse mountains, incredible Sunshine Coast hinterland, you can just hike for days and it's set up for it with all of these walking tracks called the Great Walk. They're just they're everywhere through the hinterland. You know, they link up uh, from Noosa North Shore all the way up to Rainbow Beach and you can continue on to, to Gari as well, Fraser Island. You can you can walk the length of it. So, yeah, you, you could just keep going. <laughs> and actually, we're talking about walking there, which is really apt because it's something we were talking about getting to a place under your own steam. You know, we're going to go into the details of this phenomenal bike ride of yours, but you did something extra phenomenal, which I believe you did with your partner, which was a monumental walk. You walked from Alice Springs <laughs> to Broome. Now, I'm going to invite my listeners of the show. You can maybe pause, bring up your phone and Google this on a map. Put Alice Springs to Broome <laughs> into Google Maps, get the distance out there. How far is it? 1,700 kilometres, Bella, roughly. <laughs> That's a lot of footsteps. We have to talk about this walk briefly. Talk to me about this. How did this happen? What was it like? How long did you go for? Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hi, everyone. It's me, Bella, from the show. I just wanted to let you know about something exciting. I have recently just created a new Facebook group named Seek Travel Ride where if you are a fan of the show, you can join and we can actually bring this community more to life. It's a place where you can learn more about our guests, see more photos, chat about episodes in more detail, and maybe even pose some questions as well. It's also a place where you can share your own bicycle adventure journeys, whether you've got a photo or a blog or some videos that you want to share. Come online, say hi, join the Facebook group, and let's enjoy this community that we have built. We have a global audience here. People are listening from all around the world. And I think we can only thrive and get an even greater sense of wonderlust by sharing our experiences with each other and connecting. So get onto Facebook. I've provided a link in the show notes and you can join that community as well. Thank you. 
Now back to the show. Yes, you are correct that I did do it with my partner, James. He, back in 2020, James works in the travel industry. So when COVID hit, the company he works for specializes in South America and Antarctic travel. And all of their offices in South America were basically plunged into poverty because they didn't have any government support and they rely on tourism as their only source of income. So the company was trying to come up with ideas of how to fundraise to get these guys the food that they needed, the sanitation packs that they needed just to survive in these COVID times. James is a mad adventurer, thankfully. I love his crazy ideas. And he (laughs) decided that he would walk. He wanted to walk from where we live, Alexandra Headland on the Sunshine Coast. And he was trying to walk across to the western side of Australia, originally wanted to finish in Bunbury in WA. COVID had very strict lockdown laws in Australia and WA had a hard border closure. So when he got to South Australia, realised crossing wasn't an option. So plotted his route to go north and finish at Uluru in the centre of Australia. So when we were... Well, he wanted to finish his walk. I decided that I would come along for the for the journey. And uh, the Alice Springs to Broome Walk was the second half of his journey. So I was able to, yeah, join him. We started in Alice Springs. We crossed the Tanami Desert. The aptly known Tanami Track is 1,100 kilometres of unsealed road. It's extremely remote. Our... Food stops were two communities, Yuandamu and then Willaluna, and they were 550 kilometres apart. So we needed to logistically plan for a long period of time for food and water that we were able to to carry with us. So we were self-supported, meaning that we could access shops, but otherwise we had no support vehicle. We have a genius of a flatmate who is an amazing boilermaker, and he designed or helped us build trolleys to push 60 litres of water, all of our camping equipment and food on top, and we set off. (laughs) Uh, 39 days later, we arrived at the beautiful blue waters of Broome. I just have one word for that trip, and that's wow. I have a lot of questions, but that, (laughs) whoa, (laughs) goosebumps again. So, yeah, that that was the walk. (laughs) That's insane because, and again, I've had the amazing privilege and benefit of being able to speak to some adventurers that that have cycled on world tours through some remote deserts or remote country, which requires forward planning of the type that you had on this walk, which is we're not getting a resupply for that point for food or water for X amount of days. X amount of days on a bike, though, and on a walk, that's next level. It is. 500 kilometres on a bike. It's some hard days of riding, but you can feasibly get there within a week, let's just say. I mean, you could get there shorter, maybe a little bit longer. But 500 kilometres on your two feet, how long does it take to traverse those sort of distances? I'm trying to do the maths in my head of how far could I walk, and that's without pushing 60 litres of water along in a trolley, along with everything else I need. Along with the unsealed road, the, the bulldust, the gravel, the sand that you were almost bogged in and having to skull drag a trolley through. Did you get a flat tyre on your trolley? Not until we hit the bitumen. <laughs> and of then course. there was several. <laughs> of course. Oh, wow. I know, right? Murphy um, obviously lives but, there as well. Good old Murphy's Law, right? Yeah, we, we averaged approximately a marathon a day, so around 40k a day. And yeah, we were walking eight, eight to 10 hours, pretty much sun up to sundown. Very short break in the middle of the day for lunch and you're just cracking on. So about 14 days is what we planned for food-wise between the community stores. And, yeah, you were just bush camped. I think there was three roadhouses in that 39 days. So there was 36-odd nights of bush camping, which was just amazing. And we raised money on that second half of James's journey for the Purple House who are an Indigenous owned and run health service that provide dialysis to the communities that we were walking through to try and keep people or being able to access healthcare that they need but stay on country within their support of their communities. So far out. <laughs> yeah, th- this walk blows me away. 
and I realise for my listeners, I run a podcast which is about bicycle adventures. We're going to get into Emma's amazing bicycle adventures, but I think we can all appreciate probably listening to this because we have a passion for the outdoors and travel. And if you have an imagination like mine, you, you're just thinking of this walk. You're in such a remote area. You're talking about dusty, sandy tracks through the desert. Oh, red dust everywhere. <laughs> and and your resupply points, I mean, you, you're really thankful when you get there, but it's not like you've got a packed supermarket and restaurants of choice to go to. But no. I, I'm interested to know, <laughs> did you ever play that, oh, I wish we had something like this to eat game while you're out there? And what, what were you really craving when you got there? Or was it just what do they have on the shelves and we'll take 30 of everything because we're so hungry? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we were getting a little bit towards a bit rationy before we reached our second community store. I certainly was a little bit calorie depleted. James was able to lose a little bit of weight along the walk. I unfortunately didn't have much to lose. So my first purchases were a big jar of Nutella, peanut butter and a loaf of bread. <laughs> and, you know, when you're doing an expedition like that, you, of course, are metabolizing a lot more than what you're taking in when you don't have access to real meals. It was a lot of, yeah, carb heavy stuff. So pastas, but we also had to be cognizant that we were carrying everything. So we needed to buy tin food, but we would have to eat that early so that our weight went down quicker. And we had, I guess, freeze dried vegetables, things like that, you know, two minute noodles. (laughs) Yeah, cuisine of choice for every traveler, right? (laughs) (laughs) But there was definitely ice creams involved. And I think the happiest day on that journey was when the Balgo police were coming back from Fitzroy Crossing and they actually had a, a freezer in their truck and produced calippos, which we were then eating in the middle of the desert going, how did we get <laughs> What? <laughs> we're having ice creams in the middle of the desert because of the amazing, you know, Western Australian police force. So we will be forever thankful for that day. <laughs> oh, my goodness. An ice block in the desert is just the best. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just like, oh, it's a little oasis. <laughs> Actually, when you're talking about oasis, it all takes me part, and we're going to get to this, I'm sure, but in your bicycle tour. I think you make mention of the Oasis, which was all the Mirage, which is actually real, which was like a kebab van or something and a kebab store. Oh, yeah. I'm just thinking, wow, that would be like my dream. <laughs> actually, I must say, and this that is the Aussie so in me, I think, I think if I was to have some a similar type of dream here in France, in the Pyrenees, in a remote section, it would be like to magic to a way, some, some ability to have like a proper Aussie pie with sauce. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Okay. So obviously... That walk would have provided you with some ample time to connect to different parts of the country, to really be immersed in your outdoor environment and to really gain an an appreciation of the remoteness out there. So from that walk, you've transpired then to creating a remote bicycle tour, really. And in terms of distance, it's over. What was the total distance that you went on in the end here on your bicycle tour? Two and a half thousand kilometres. Yeah, maybe 2,500 and... 50 odd kilometers, I think. (laughs) Unfortunately, I'm not very good with the technology. So yeah, my device didn't accurately record the trip. So I sort of relied on a little bit of a mapping from the route that I took. But yeah, I probably should know the exact number. I cycled it. So numbers are insignificant, because really, it's not the reason why you're doing it. I'm just more pining it into perspective as well because it's a remote distance through some remote landscapes you you obviously were pedaling on the iconic red dirt of Australia as well in the center yeah. there across the deserts but what was the longest distance then between on your cycle tour just while we're talking about resupply points like was that as remote as your walk no so the eastern way is a lot more well serviced and even on the Remote Plenty Highway, which is the gravel section of about 450 kilometres. There was two campsites and, yeah, just before the Queensland border, there's a, there's a third one. So, like, the, the distance, you think, it, yeah, it wasn't that far between stops. So, max I had to plan for was two to three days, <laughs> which is a huge difference to 14 days when we were doing the walk. Yeah, absolutely. And also the time of year that you're doing it as well, like you're obviously not doing it in the heights of summer, although conversely, did you have to deal with some really, really cold overnights in, in temperatures as well? 
Absolutely. It was supposed to be the dry season and then about 10 days before we were leaving, they had a huge unprecedented amount of rain out in central Australia, which closed the majority of the roads leading in and out of Alice Springs. So we were sort of watching the uh, the road reports and thankfully it opened. But uh, yeah, the temperatures in the desert are quite cool overnight, um, definitely single digits. I feel like the western side when we did the walk was colder. Maybe that was just because of this sort of recent rain. The temperature was maybe a little bit warmer. But yeah, there were certainly days where I wore almost every single layer <laughs> until about 10 a.m. when it would it warmed up to about 20, 25 degrees maximum. So it's a beautiful time to travel out there and having that recent rain changed the landscape significantly as well. I was privileged to see rolling green hills in the middle of the desert. You go like, like where am I? <laughs> that would just be an incredible vista. It would be so uplifting to see it because it would tra- the water just transforms the landscape really. Mm-hmm. It always amazes me that there's something in the landscape that generates when it goes for so long with nothing, that there's things that are able to generate. Yeah, it does. They just need an opportunity to have a little bit of water and then, hey, I'm going to show you my face, whatever that looks like. (laughs) Wow. So you talk about green landscapes. Were there also desert wildflowers or anything like that at all? or A little bit. Uh, Probably not as much as you would see in other times of the year. And it's still, I guess, that stark contrast between the the red dirt of a road, but then having yeah the the green on the outside, I guess, was yeah what was what was different. And when we were doing the Tanami track, it just seemed to the landscape certainly changed, but probably because we were going slower as well, <laughs> it wasn't as green or abundant with life as what the eastern side was. Let's backtrack a little bit then back to the. Back to your cycle here. So before you're actually setting off, had you actually done any long or short bicycle tours previously? We spoke, you know, in our intro that you (laughs) you rode a fixed bike in the big thriving city of London. But what about bicycle touring experience? Had you had any before setting off here? Uh, Negative, no. (laughs) I hadn't done any bicycle touring. I do own four bikes, however, Bella. So I guess that's something to my credit. (laughs) Love it. Yeah, I bought my first bike to do a triathlon when I was living in London. And I dabbled in that sport for a short period of time, but never really seriously or competitively. And did enjoy cycling, but it wasn't, I guess, until I returned to Australia. In fact, not even really until after I'd done the walk and started to form this idea that maybe I could cross the second half of Australia on two wheels, which was going to be much quicker than two feet. And then, yeah, I joined a a little local cycle group called the Renegade Riders, made up with some amazing, inspirational women. And I think I just voiced this crazy idea one day. And once you voice something, it starts to become a reality. It's like people get very curious and then you're held a little bit more accountable to this idea actually coming to fruition. (laughs) So I, yeah, I started training maybe in, oh, I want to say maybe in March. And I think I might have, maybe the longest ride I'd done prior to that was 40k because that was what I had to do in a triathlon back in 2010. <laughs> wow so you started training in March and hang on I'm, I'm getting my months mixed up was the trip in June or July? That started in July 10th of July. It's not much time to actually I mean it's better than nothing but yeah you, you, yeah. <laughs> you covered some last distance because actually I think that one of the largest distances you covered in the day was like 170 kilometers. Yeah, that's correct. From the Middle- Middleton Hotel to Winton. Yeah. With a load. <laughs> I was going to say, and I'm, I'm also thinking of the terrain. Now, I do know that it wasn't all on dirt. You did you did hit the asphalt and, you know, the tarmac. But, my gosh, you would have had to deal with some lovely corrugated roads in the outset. So how did you prepare then? So you put the idea out there to the world, so you're accountable to it, and now you make, you've decided you're making it happen. How did you convince yourself that you could make it happen and get yourself to the to the first day there? I think part of that journey was drawing on the experience from the walk and I I had trained enough for that that I guess my driving force was I didn't want to be the one to let James down to finish his journey. So I had trained probably more than he did 
but he already mentally knew what he was in for because he'd done the first half of that journey. So he was quite experienced, whereas I guess transitioning then to the bike, I thought, well, I just need to see how the body goes. Yes, I've been on a bike before. Yes, I can cycle. I used to commute every day in London, but admittedly it was probably 12 kilometres return. (laughs) I've done a bit of mountain biking here and there, but apart from the road bike a long time ago, was just, yeah, needed to make sure that the body was okay with it. And then by joining a, a riding group, I was able to get some insight from experienced cyclists within that to have discussions and yarns about, is this even possible? Am I completely crazy? What do I need to do to to get where I need to be? And it was then just spending the time to get comfortable on my road bike initially and then deciding the type of bike that I was going to use for the expedition, sourcing that and starting to practice off-road and loaded. So we're very lucky in Queensland, we've got rail trails, which have been converted into these cycleways. So I use the Kilkeven to Kingaroy cycle uh, rail trail to do, I guess, a significant part of my training that was then off-road on gravel. There's a, about a 40 kilometre section, which is quite rocky and it's amazing country out there. Like it's actually grandma's country. It's Waka Waka country. So I loved going out there to cycle anyway, but you're cycling through these stations so you're you're opening and closing the gates so that the cattle don't get out and yeah it it was it was awesome and just building up time so I wasn't fussed about the speed that I was doing it was just more about spending hours in the saddle because I knew that would be what I was doing during the expedition yeah and I guess to some degree the speed's going to be what it's going to be and it's going to be dependent on weather factors wind factors terrain factors but it's actually time in the saddle I've mentioned this with a few other guests as well, and I, and I often raise it if someone approaches me and, and is seeking some uh, thought or input into a bicycle tour and is trying to plan out a route and daily distances. And my first thing is don't look at distances, think of it as time. How far can I ride? How many hours do I want to be on my bike each day? Mm-hmm. If you're thinking I can do five hours a day, I can do 10 hours a day, I can be incredible and do 15 hours a day whatever that is for you maybe you only want a two hour day but but your distances will fall out from that as opposed to I want to do 100 kilometers a day and then you have a raging headwind which means that well you can do that but you're going to be cycling in the dark twice as long (laughs) yeah and and hating life probably (laughs) that makes sense so (laughs) no the time transition absolutely makes sense as opposed to the climate like and that was what I had to get my mind around because I think when you do a group ride anywhere like I didn't even have a device until one of my amazing friends Nat gave it to me (laughs) so I now own a Garmin but yeah you know it's all focused on the Strava times and it doesn't count unless it's on Strava and what's your average pace and that for me it just didn't even come into it it was just it's me, it's my bike, I'm getting where I need to be and I'm just sitting in a saddle. It was the same as when I taught about I had to learn how to swim again when I signed up for that triathlon. <laughs> oh, I need to hear this it's story. It's time in the pool. It's time you know. in the pool, okay. Oh, no. I could only sort of swim breaststroke and my friend signed me up for a triathlon so then I needed to do 1,500 metres and obviously the quickest way to do that is freestyle. So I just started off doing breaststroke saying it's okay, you're in the water. And then starting to, yeah, you know, transition back into putting the arms over and through instead of just keeping them under the water. And look, you know. Is this like literally jumping in at the deep end? (laughs) Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it totally was. Totally was. Survive. (laughs) I love it. Okay, so then the route that you took, I've assumed Alice Alice to Alex, Alice Springs to Alexandra Headland. So you took off from from Alice Springs is that that's correct or the outskirts of Alice Springs or the very center or just the outskirts yeah so technically we had already walked 30 kilometers out of Alice Springs to get to the Tanami track I recall that being very hilly and quite hard with a heavy loaded trolley (laughs) so technically to do the crossing I'd I'd already done that 30 kilometers so I started at the Tanami track turn off and then proceeded to go north till I hit the Plenty Highway and turned right to travel back to the ocean. Back to home. And so then we spoke about this at the very outset of the podcast. Some of your motivations yourself was to find that personal connection to country. So am I right then to think, Emma, that the way you design your route is that it would be traveling through 
areas which meant which had family significance obviously yes yes but um I guess that wasn't until I was a lot closer to home so Waka Waka country is the neighboring country to where we are on the Sunshine Coast so it's just to the west of here so I actually had a long distance to travel until I got to uh, grandma's country and in choosing the route there's a few different ways like I could have gone sort of south and then through Roma and headed across to Brisbane and I think even one of them might have been slightly shorter, probably a little bit less hilly (laughs) as well. I certainly had a lot more elevation choosing the route than I did. But the reason for that was so I could have that connection once I made it to Waka Waka country. Yeah, wow. And I guess also then you're travelling with that mindset of connecting to the family connection. But I, I... and again, I use the word assumption so much, and I'm sorry for that, but it's obviously just how I speak. <laughs> no. Is it, an, is it a correct assumption on my part, though, that you're traveling in areas with that curiosity in mind to learn about the Indigenous cultures through the different countries that you are traversing through as well and the different lands of different groups? Yeah, absolutely. As, as best I could, it was unfortunate that I only had a limited amount of time to do the expedition, so... I needed to be back for work so I only had a specific amount of time off work and it didn't allow me to explore as much as I would have liked to connect with the locals but I was very cognizant of always knowing whose country I was entering. I every morning and every evening I look at the stars and I'm always thankful to the ancestors of the country that I'm on hoping that they'll they will keep me safe while I'm a visitor and a guest on their land to keep me going and always yeah so it was part of the journey and I did reach out to as many sort of councils and Aboriginal corporations where I could to specifically request permission to do my expedition in advance as well where I was able to. I don't even know how to phrase this but how many different is it countries is it regions is it areas I'm sorry (laughs) yeah and actually this is a good point to bring up the fact that I as an Australian educated in Australia am actually even unsure of how to describe the area that you're going through but how many different traditional country areas or, or different areas of different groups of Indigenous people to go through. How do I, okay, I need to phrase that properly, but you're going to educate me and my listeners now and telling me how I should have said that. (laughs) I think it's it's fine to frame it however however you know how to frame it. And for for me, there's nations within Australia, Aboriginal nations, and then there's specific tribes. When we go into native title, we're looking at traditional custodians of that land who have been recognised. And there's multiple, well over... 250 different groups within Australia and languages that matched at one point as well. So the culture and the diversity is so unique to every different tribe. Um, And when we think about Europe being so culturally diverse within countries, they're a lot, lot larger than the land areas that we are looking at when we look at an Aboriginal map of Australia. I couldn't tell you the number of countries that I traversed during that journey, but multiple. And sometimes the country overlaps in different places as well because we would often associate that country with the town that has been built on that land as opposed to a specific sort of geographic area that used to be Aboriginal land. And I hope I've done that justice. (laughs) <laughs> it's it's it, it is a lot more in depth than that. Oh wow! And you're mentioning obviously you were restricted with time and time off from work. With this style of trip and discovering what you did on this style of trip, has it given you the thirst and the motivation to a maybe head back and discover these areas a bit more in detail, or actually discover other areas and other nations across Australia in this similar manner? I think it's a a bit of both. Yeah, just, you know, still everybody's journey is so different. So, And I'm, I'm not talking about a bicycle journey at this point. I'm talking about a personal journey and a cultural journey for me. And it's, it's learning from my elders who are still here, making sure that I learn their stories so that that knowledge isn't lost. We've lost language over time. My grandmother is still alive. Unfortunately, she does have quite advanced dementia. So she's not able to to share any more those songs that she would sing to us when we were were children. But, yeah, drawing on my aunties and uncles and and learning from their experiences just to to try and understand a bit. And then for me, 
I've got a, a real passion about trying to give back in through the work that I do as a paramedic into that healthcare industry and how we can improve education, employment and healthcare for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. That's not cycling related. Sorry, Bella, that's a massive tangent. <laughs> Doesn't need to be. It's about you and your personal journey here as well because you're actively involving yourself in, in trying to help bridge the gap in those areas because it's a huge inequality there and Indigenous people are overrepresented at the wrong end of the statistics on all those areas that you discussed. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Unfortunately. I'm just, I'm just try, putting myself in your shoes there on this trip as well because, again, you're travelling. And I feel many bicycle travellers are doing this, the reason we take a journey and our motivations. But overwhelmingly, I feel there's a sense of curiosity in our minds as well and a, and a thirst for knowledge and an understanding and an exploration and a learning that takes place there. Yes. And you've had it in this way, in this journey, you've got a profound connection to as well. What was it like then taking off on day one at the start of that day, like, Foot in the pedals, away you go. Yeah. It actually started rather unexpectedly. So logistics-wise, James drove me out to Alice Springs because that was, you know, one of the cheapest and probably the easiest uh, way to get out there with a a bike and all of my panniers to be able to cycle home. But we were, we'd made it to the Plenty Highway and had uh, just bush camped up the road and got woken at about 3 a.m. by a a little resident rodent that was trying to eat the fridge <laughs> underneath the truck. So <laughs> it, it was then, oh, well, we're awake. Let's just crack on. Meaning that we arrived where we needed to be close to Alice Springs by lunchtime. So I was like, I'm just going to get on the bike and start. <laughs> Why not? So in some ways it was, I wasn't that prepared, but in saying that the first campsite was only 130 kilometers away. So it was achievable within that afternoon and yeah I was then okay well made it to the campground tomorrow (laughs) tomorrow I guess it really starts it's almost like I got a a free day even though I I cycled more than 100k that day it was still yeah in my mind wasn't quite the start (laughs) that's interesting so hang on why why was leaving from the campsite why did that feel more of the start so why did leaving on day two feel to you like it was the real start yeah, like being able to, I guess I was um, supported by James driving me out. So he was still at the campsite, which meant that I didn't have to carry a full load. I was just carrying some water and things that day. Whereas the next day I'm like, okay, well now it gets real. <laughs> Strap it all on and, and off I go. I understand now. Okay, okay, okay then. Day two, you're going. No one's carrying your panniers now. Yeah, I've got the bags on. It was, it was awesome. Because I didn't, I guess it's one of those things in the lead up to it, you don't know what to expect. And I didn't go, I had some experience from the walk, but didn't have really any expectations of what it was going to be like on the bike. And I think that that was in some ways, it just left me open to being able to experience it as it was and then going, okay, well, this is me and I got this. Let's go. So you have this own self-confidence that you can actually do what's ahead of you as well. And you had some challenges on the way. I've got written down here as a point of note, 19 days of phenomenal headwinds. <laughs> when did they kick in on this trip? <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, it took me 23 days and I was pretty lucky for the last four or so. <laughs> oh. So pretty early on. When we live on the Sunshine Coast, we think of the winter westerlies and have these beautiful, calm, you know, milk pond oceans that have no swell, no wind. And in my mind, I thought, sure, winter westerlies, surely that happens in the middle of Australia. (laughs) Unfortunately, it was mostly easterly, southeasterly winds, and they were very reliable. They would sort of come knocking on your face around 8 or 9 a.m. every morning. For me, I had a window pretty much between 4 a.m. and 8 a.m. to try and get as far as I could before the wind started. And then they just, I guess, slowly beat you down. They slow you down. And yeah, (laughs) I guess the other things associated with that. And so then that was, was that unexpected totally for you? Like that was something that you learned from doing on the trip that, okay, and so the way you dealt with it is adjusting your time. You're going to be up at early, or as we would call it, sparrow's fart, up before the sun and just push on before the wind catches up with you and starts and beats you in the face. 
Yeah, I think there's always that unexpected, like you're, you're at the whatever happens with the weather, the terrain. You don't know, you can't plan for that. You can have an idea about it, but it may change anyway. So going into it with, I guess, you know, oh yeah, it'll be, it'll be okay. We live in a very windy area though. So cycling into headwinds wasn't unfamiliar for me. Not all of my training days, you certainly get better days, but yeah, it, it was just, it was what happened. So you adjust accordingly. And that was for me that time frame because it meant that I could get a significant portion of the day out of the way before you start battling into the headwinds. So if I could get sort of 40 kilometers before the winds started, I just felt like I was going to get where I needed to on that day because I was already kind of halfway there in my mind. So it was, it was a mindset thing as well to make sure that I was confident. Okay, well, yeah, the rest of it. But do you know what? I've still got daylight for another eight, ten hours, so I'm good. <laughs> yeah, it's that mental mental confidence that you get. It's like a mental head start that you've given yourself from physically getting up active and early. And actually, can I just say, the other benefit is you're getting to see a beautiful sunrise every morning. Every day. And that's the direction you're pointed to. The sun comes up in the east. So yep. I've actually not experienced the desert in Australia. So that is something that I want to experience at some stage. But I, I, I just have this vision of desert sunrises being phenomenal. And this because the horizon to me must feel so big. Yeah, it, it really changes. And what I um, found when we were walking west I love that time of day. James didn't really appreciate me making him get up early so we could see the sunrise every day. However, we did. And the colours change irrespective of which way you're looking. So you think about a sunrise and that's what you're focused on. But actually, when we were walking west, the colours that change as a result of the sun rising in the opposite side of the horizon is just as spectacular as the the sun rising. Yeah, they truly, truly are. You're you're speaking to a passionate photographer here, a passionate landscape photographer, and the motivations for me to do my very early morning rides when I lived in Australia was very, very much sunrise. In fact, I can vividly remember pretty much my alarm would go off at like ridiculous hour. Uh, I remember it started with a four in front, so that was never great. But the first thing I would do was actually peel the curtains open on, over the balcony window to see, oh, what's the sky going to be like today? Is it going to be clear? Is it starry? oh, there's some clouds there. Oh, wow, I'm up for something really good. And that was my own motivation. What's the bird song like and the dawn chorus like in the desert? I feel, I don't even know if that's a stupid question, but is there much bird life? Yeah, there is. It's actually really pretty compared to, I think sometimes around suburbia, you have the crows and the cockatoos, which may not be described as very pretty bird song when they're waking people up (laughs) four or five in the morning. Whereas out there, there's a lot more diversity and, yeah, more sort of chirpy, polite <laughs> song as opposed to, yeah, some of the raucous stuff that you might hear in the suburban areas. And definitely that changed with the landscapes as well when there was when the bush sort of started to come in through the hilly areas and it was a lot closer to the road. It was definitely a lot more abundant in that bird song. Yeah, it's beautiful. Oh, it would be. And again, paired with the sunrises. But I mean, I know that you're traveling east, but I'm sure at sunset, your head was flicking around and looking at the colors changing around you as well at sunset, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're my favorite time of day. And then, yeah, the stars, obviously. Love um, seeing that. The last star to leave us in the morning and the first one to come in at nighttime. They're, they're sort of special because they're just, they're always there. They don't change unless you can't see them with the cloud. It's one of those constants which is reassuring for me yeah it it really is and the night sky and seeing the stars in the areas that you have been would have just been absolutely phenomenal spectacular like the milky way really exists (laughs) it's there's just so many of them so many and just the definition within the sky as well yeah and the amount of satellites that you see and also shooting stars like you just can't see when you're in populated areas they just don't happen there was one day on the walk where we started early to try and get to a campsite and I saw four shooting stars in one morning I don't think I could even say that I would have seen four in four nights in a row at any other time in my life but yeah to be able to make four wishes in one morning was pretty nice (laughs) 
You were talking there about you loved seeing the the last star and the, you know and the first star and, and those. Did you ever actually look for constellations and stuff? Were there ever you know things that you would look to point out in the night sky, or was it just looking up in amazement? No, just in amazement. Yeah, I think I know constellations take a little bit of imagination, and geographically, I'm a little challenged at times, so I probably would have got them wrong. I did do that when I was with James because he's a little bit more knowledgeable about the constellations. So that was interesting. We'd be able to um, enjoy that once the sun set at night time, just be able to, yeah, look up at that amazing night sky. And it, look, it, it was teaching me things and I, I promptly forgot them. You're immersed in the star experience. Did you have a full moon during your trip as well? I did. I did, which was pretty special because it meant that you didn't need to use as much light <laughs> when you're leaving in the mornings. You're able to sort of navigate and just coming in to the Sunshine Coast, it was almost a full moon and I just remember the most spectacular, the moon was lit up, it was a misty morning, it was shining over a dam and it just took my breath away. It was so beautiful and you think, oh, I wish I could capture that but my my trusty little iPhone would not do anything like that justice. So it was just, this is my memory and I'm taking it and it's amazing. If it makes you feel any better, it doesn't matter, like the photographer and me, it doesn't matter what the end picture looks like. It never matches what that image is in my mind and, and then how much it's, it's just the colours pop in a different way through our own vision that we just cannot replicate through a lens. It doesn't matter how much you know or whatever, it's, it's never going to be 100% the same. But those moments live with you forever. Absolutely. Do you have a favourite sunrise then that you saw and where were you for that? Oh, I think one of my favourites, I'm just, I can, I can picture it clearly. I'm just trying to remember which part of the journey it was on. It was the first one that I hadn't, hadn't seen on the horizon. So I was at some elevation for once, um, for the first time in that trip. And it took me by surprise because I'm like, oh, hang on a second. I'm up high. It's not rising sort of straight in front of me. I'm having to, you know, cycle up a little bit and look over to be able to see the sunrise this morning. So, yeah, that, that was pretty special. I just I can't remember exactly what day it was, but I know the sunrise. I've got that in my memory. A special moments. Something, Emma, I must say, which I really liked when I was researching a bit about your trip and looking on your Facebook page where you'd posted about it was I, I had a great laugh and a chuckle at your videos and I love your narration to them. So there's a moment where there's like a pack of emus. Is that the term for a collective oh, group yeah. of emus? I'm not sure. Um, anyway. I'm not sure either. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not, it's not <laughs> a term that you really use a lot, is it? It's not like a mob of roos or something. But no. A flock of emus? They're birds, aren't they? Hmm. Might be a, well, birds, yeah, they, they can have, be a flock. Anyway, a group of emus, more than one, several emus running alongside you and you're just like, you are so ripping and enjoying life at that moment and talking to them and talking out oh. loud. <laughs> I loved it because I feel like that's something I would do. <laughs> so <laughs> it also resonates to me that you're talking to the animals there, but also you are your own company because you're taking this trip solo. So it's very different to how you set off with the walk where you had your partner with you. You're on your own apart mm. from, you know, some strangers that you're meeting or your resupply points at certain points. What was it like to be in your own company for that long? I really enjoyed it. And I think from the, like, I'm not a big social media person. So I actually found it hard to do the Alistair Alex Facebook page and keep regular updates. It was actually really refreshing when we were on the Tanami track and had pretty much zero connectivity for about 36 days of the 39 that we were walking. So yeah, I, I'm quite comfortable in my own space. I enjoy I think doing the job that I do, I'm very cognizant that I give a lot to people, to patients when I'm at work. So I, I check myself and make sure that I have days where I'm just recharging me, whatever that looks like, whatever I need it in that time, whether it's, it's exercise, cycling, going for a hike, swimming, Malulaba Bay, something that just, you know, lets me recharge me. So I'm, I'm quite comfortable in, in doing that. And yeah, I, it was very different to the walk though, because you've got somebody else to rely on when things go wrong. Whereas it was sort of like, oh, I know it's just me now. 
that's, yeah, am I going to be able to, to do this on my own was, I guess, part of the challenge and part of the reason that I wanted to do it as well, just so I could find that out. Yeah, and get the answer to that question. So, I mean, I mean, and no trip is without its own little form of adversity and whether that's a mechanical, whether it's a physical struggle or a mental struggle, what was probably something that gave you the most point for pause and maybe concern or what was some of the most adverse stuff that you had to push through and get yourself through? Oh, the winds were, were hard, but I... I adopted the mantra that, um, you know, I experienced them, I guess, a little bit on the gravel, but probably not as bad as when I transitioned to the bitumen. It was that mantra of, well, it could be windy and you're on gravel or it could be windy and rainy, but it's not. It's just windy. (laughs) You're on bitumen. Just keep going. (laughs) Probably the scariest bit that I, not really scary, but I guess being a a little bit risk adverse in some ways was when I was coming into Springshaw and it was by far the windiest day that I'd experienced and there was gusts of up to 60 kilometres an hour with a fully loaded bike on a road with traffic. It just didn't feel safe because there was a lot of hills and going down a hill at speed with winds coming sideways, front ways, every which way. I was just like, oh, (laughs) I'm like 30k from Springshaw. How long is this going to take me? I think I just stopped. (laughs) I had some chocolate. I thought, they're not going. I'll just start walking. Why not? (laughs) I've still got two feet. I felt safer. Got to, I guess, a less hilly section and then just started cycling again slowly and still had daylight on my side. So, yeah. It's that sort of stop. You you sort of joke, you know, you had chocolate or something. I had some friends come and stay just recently. We were joking about always having like a Snickers bar on hand or something like, you know, like (laughs) there's always something, something that gives you that lift. But often what you need is just a stop, a break, a food and a mental research to realize, oh, I love what you're saying there, Emma, in that you got yourself into a more positive view of a mindset Mm. of what was going on this is challenging but it could be worse and I'm fortunate so let's let's make the most of it let's do something yeah just keep going (laughs) did you realize that you were consciously doing that 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 was one of your things that you'd pull out of your arsenal like okay I'm going to give myself a positive mindset on this definitely and sometimes a distraction technique like when I was on the on the back roads like I don't cycle with headphones but I had the little snack bag on the top so I could put a podcast on and have it playing but I could still hear the environment for safety reasons I had a mirror on my bike as well so I could always see the um, traffic coming behind me but yeah distraction techniques worked well and I must admit I certainly listened to a lot of Seek Travel Ride podcasts so thank you the music you play at the start and the end I wish I had a longer recording of that because it's just a a nice little get into that beat and you can just keep going. The, the wind isn't there anymore. It's okay. I'll have to send it to you. I'll have to send it to you. But actually, while we're talking about music, it's actually a new question I've only just started asking guests because I was interviewing a guest, Mackenzie Barney. We got onto the topic and then I agree and I promise that I'm going to start asking guests and actually create a music playlist. And I don't know whether music was something that you listened to at all as well as podcasts, but regardless of that, if you were to pick a song to sum up your tour or a theme song for your tour, what would it be? Um, I think probably one of my favourite, favourite, favourite songs. It's by Busby Maru, who are actually a, a band from Rockhampton where I grew up. And they have a song called Paint This Land. And it does talk about connecting the desert to the sea. And there's also didgeridoo in that song as well. And my, my brother has performed with Busby Maru and I've heard this song and, and him on the didgeridoo, it also has such a, a strong, I guess, spiritual connection for me as well. Just love it. I could listen to it on repeat. <laughs> oh, I love it. I've written it down. I don't know if I've written it right, so I might even ask you to send me something. I'm hoping that I can find it out there so I can I can add it and listen to it myself. I'm excited about it, actually. All right, so we've talked about incredible energising moments in nature and getting yourself through the struggles there. What about other points of happiness? Because 
and it, it's a constant theme with lots of my guests is that those unexpected moments of meeting strangers on the road and on the route and how uplifting they are. You talked about on the walk, meeting the, the policeman that gave you Calippo ice blocks and ice creams in the desert. Yeah. What sort of energising moments perhaps or encounters with strangers did you have on the way that really stick out? There were so many. What was really surprising and I loved was that there was a lot of solo female travellers, in not, not on bicycles, but just with a caravan or in a camper. And I remember one day specifically where I stopped at uh, a little place outside of Bulia, not too far from there, and it's the ruins of a hotel called Hotel Hamilton, but it's in the Great Artesian Basin. So it has fresh water, it had a shower. <laughs> I was like, I'm getting there. It was windy. So I'm like, do you know what? I'm just taking a break in the middle of the day. It's not not what I had planned to do, but actually I've got this shelter here. There's cows in the paddock over there. I can have a shower. I can use my stove, cook some lunch, have a warm lunch. And it was actually amazing because I met so many travelers that were just, you know, pulling in for a rest stop. And they're on these incredible journeys and just happy to have a yarn and would stop and eat their lunch. They obviously, I, I look like a, a poor cyclist, so they're offering me biscuits and you know, all a cup of tea and all of those wonderful things that you do connect with. So, you know, you're able to have a cup of tea with lots of different people who are traveling from all around Australia on their own little journeys. And yeah, some of them I, I met that were from Budrum, which is the next suburb over from where I am here at Alex, and they met me at the finish line. Like just amazing to to make these connections and yeah, it was awesome. That's brilliant. And just having a yarn with a biscuit and a tea. Oh, ah, oh, so good. <laughs> Actually, this can't be an episode of Seek Travel Ride if I don't bring up food in some way. But you just you just sparked me to think about Aussie biscuits. Now, I actually have in my cupboard here in France, and it's sort of like a ration pack, right? Like it's like an emergency. <laughs> it's actually one of the – it's a, the Arnott's collection of like cream biscuits. In the – yeah. Okay. Which one are you picking? <laughs> so we've got <laughs> – Oh, the, the Monte Carlo or the Kingston every time. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Monte Carlo or a Kingston. I'm one of those – I don't know if I'm a freak, but I actually quite enjoy the, is it the the orange, the orange creams? Oh, I, yeah, the orange slice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's I me. could be a shortbread if I'm dunking it. Oh, shortbread cream for life. Absolutely. Mm. You know, I feel like you're inspiring me to open that packet. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure it's a very special occasion. They're hard to come oh, by. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Lots of cup of teas and coffees in my future. Yeah. So we talked at the outset there. Emma, about how you definitely wanted to make a connection with country and specifically to your family sort of roots there and how they're very close to home. And we've talked a bit about your grandmother there as well. I'd love to have some insights into what it was like when you finally hit that part of your trip and what are the sort of things that sort of stuck with you and resounded with you so, so much there? The biggest thing, once I crossed into to grandma's country, it was probably the hilliest day that I'd experienced. So I was traveling between Krakow and Eidsvold and there's a few ranges. You're sort of, yeah, there's, there's just lots of mountain. And it was actually the most beautiful bitumen section that I had cycled on. It had an amazing wide shoulder. It wasn't well-traveled. Like the car traffic was very minimal. But the hills really destroyed me and I was... I pulled up into Eidsvold and was pretty much, okay, I'm getting a room for the night because I just need to recover from that. I was, I was completely spent, but just really enjoyed, I guess, recharging that afternoon. It's a very small place, Eidsvold, and focusing on the, the next leg in the morning and, and getting across to, to Gainda, but looking at a different, different way as opposed to the main road. So I was able to take a connecting back road and it was just just beautiful and the biggest thing I remember from this day before I went up the 14% gradient of Ouch. Wayne's Hill out, um, <laughs> fully loaded, was there was no wind. <laughs> there, was, <laughs> there was no wind, Bella. So the wind actually, yeah, I didn't have wind for, for four days and that was the first that I pretty much had experienced on, on the cycle. <laughs> And was it, yeah, it, I was like, oh, <laughs> someone looking after me, they're being kind to me. 
And I was just so thankful and so grateful to, again, like I said earlier, be on, be on my push bike under my own steam to, to get to these places. Getting into Ban Ban Springs, which is, I guess, like a traditional meeting place for neighboring tribes. And it's this freshwater spring. It's warm and being able to, to sit and spend time and be lost in my own thoughts in that space is something that I will have forever. It was, yeah, really, really, really special, really special. I'm trying to put myself in your shoes there and actually thinking about what that would be like as well. And especially being in a place, like you said, it's got such significance to the area. You know, it's a meeting place. It's a sacred site. What kind of conversations have been had in this area? What what sort of discussions and decisions are made here? You know, what sort of tales mm. could the landscape tell me? I imagine they're the sort of things that you've possibly been thinking about in that in that time as well. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the the dream time stories that are then passed down from generation to generation uh, about how things came to existence and our rainbow serpent and yeah, just being able to be still and appreciate the beauty of of what we have. You were talking at the very outset, we were talking about your grandmother and, you know, we were talking about her, her passion to make sure that those in her family were educated and, and things like that. But when we're talking about, I guess, your own sort of background and culture and past, did you have, like, those Dreamtime stories, were they told to you by her? And, and so... Did you have those in your mind when you were going through that area too? Probably more just from, I guess, my aunties and my my uncles. Yeah. My childhood is a little bit of a distant memory. I'm not that old, but <laughs> there's, yeah, things that, yeah, I, it's probably more the connection, I guess, a little bit later in life once I've, I guess, returned from the overseas experience and come back to Australia and that I'm, and that I'm still learning. I don't think we ever get to an age where we stop learning about things. And if anything, it's certainly something for me myself. And whenever I visit, you know, my family now and I speak with my mother now, it's like I have this curiosity within me to learn more about my my own things and, and to hear stories that, that are significant to my family. So I imagine you're probably in a similar way doing doing similar things at this stage as well. Yeah, it's a journey of discovery and it's never going to end. We're always learning and I think that innate curiosity is just, yeah, it's always going to be there. And it's whether it's learning about, you know, my history or somebody else's, I'm just, yeah, intrigued always. <laughs> Do you feel that like you learned a lot about yourself during this trip then, like reflecting back? I think it would be hard not to learn about yourself. I, it's funny when you go into something like this, not really knowing if it's going to be achievable. And I, in some ways, it's funny because James, yes, took me out there, but then he travelled back to the Sunshine Coast and flew to New Zealand so he could do his own training whilst I was on, on my expedition. So in some ways, I, I often say I was just stitched in the desert and I only had one way home. So it was two wheels and, and that was it. I had to, had to get home of my own steam. But each day that you go through, it does just get a little bit easier you get a little bit more confidence and you're like oh yeah actually I do I do got this I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get there <laughs> whatever happens you know you you're on the gravel and I had trained on gravel but certainly not for the extended period of time so then you you're dealing with the saddle sores that you get because you've been bouncing up and down for hundreds of kilometers Oh, corrugations yeah the corrugations which yeah, I don't know how much training you can put in for that it's just it's going to be what it's going to be yeah I don't think anything prepares you for that washboard type <laughs> of surface there no. it just oh in fact as a paramedic how did you deal with the saddle sore issue then like what was your strategy there <laughs> well I didn't have much choice I just had to keep going I only took two pairs of nicks so there was I guess the frequent changing Frequent changing of the nicks and yeah, I had um, chamois cream. It did a little bit and then pawpaw ointment overnight <laughs> just to give it a little bit of relief. You know, I talked about the packet of the Arnott's biscuits. The you other thing that I really love from Australia. Yeah, that little <laughs> that little red. <laughs> I oh, love it. It's, it's yeah. the best. It's the best. But um, yeah, honestly, having to spend that much time in the saddle, nothing was going to make them go away until I, I stopped <laughs> in Alice. Uh, Alex, <laughs> sorry. 
<laughs> there was a day where I decided to cycle standing up. I did try and, <laughs> and do a lot of cycling without sitting in the saddle thinking, oh, maybe a day of that will help. <laughs> but it was actually pretty hard because <laughs> you try to cycle and you're not going up a hill and you've got a fully loaded bike. But anywho, got to try something. You're engaging different muscle groups there as well. Like it will give you some momentary relief, but ultimately you've got to sit on that seat. Yeah, literally. <laughs> And I guess the other physical ailment that came up for you was some tendonitis as well, wasn't it? In your, was it your Achilles? Randomly, just in my, my right foot, the perineal tendon decided to flare up about four days out. And it was just, a yeah, obviously a little bit cranky that I hadn't rested it for however many days. So decided to tell me it was unhappy. But yeah, a bit of Panadol here. And I, had a, I did take a trigger point ball with me. So I was able to actually roll out the bottom of my feet which helps significantly. And then, yeah, just some anti-inflammatories. I had some tiger balm because it was the smallest pot of something that I could find. They really are little pots, actually. Yeah, they really are small, aren't they? They are. They are. Handy. As long as you've got access to hand washing afterwards. Gosh, don't touch things. (laughs) It was fine. It rectified itself as soon as I stopped cycling. So it was just like a repetitive strain injury, really. Interesting that it's never come up before, but at least you were able to deal with it. And and obviously you're using your positive mindset there as well to help get you through. You've got the skills and the tools and things that you need and you can make it happen, which is great. I was so close to home. It wasn't going to stop me. It's like, I can deal with that. I'm going to get home. So what was it like to ride home? What was it like to arrive there? You had a little welcoming party. Yeah, it was amazing. I actually had A paramedic who'd been following my journey who I'd never met cycle uh, about 80k north from Nambour to meet me halfway home on my last day and then cycled all the way through to Alex with me and my renegade rider ladies met me 20k from the finish as well. So it's sort of, it was so reassuring at that point. I was like, I am going to get home today. Like nothing is going to stop me. I've got somebody to talk to now and distract me from the hilliest day of the trip, <laughs> coming back into the Sunshine Coast. And then I had my ladies to, to get me home. So they broke the headwind because it was back by that day. <laughs> yeah, heading, heading back into Alex Surf Club, which was the, the finishing point. And my family and friends, the Teal family, so Queensland Ambulance Service, they had a lot of officers there, which was amazing, colleagues of mine. Yeah, it, it was the best. <laughs> I don't think it sunk in that I had finished on that day, probably not until a day or two later, but actually it was the next day because it rained overnight and I woke up thinking, I've got to get on my bike and it's raining. Oh my gosh, that I got a poncho and then I realized I'm at home. (laughs) I don't have to get on my bike today. (laughs) Yeah, so because that's actually a question I often ask people who go on these type of journeys and that is, has it sunk in for you? Like, okay, you had that realisation, the ride is over, you don't have to get back on, but has it truly sunk in for you now? I Look, I think so, but it's weird because I can say, oh, yes, I've, I've crossed Australia, but at the same time it was only one day at a time. So when we did the walk it was 40K a day, it wasn't a 1,700-kilometre journey and it was the same coming back. It was one day at a time. It wasn't 2,500 kilometres that I was crossing. So. You know, in my mind, it's sort of like, well, I just needed to get 150k from Kilkeven back to Alex, and that was the end of the ride. It wasn't, I know there was everything else that led to that point, but it was still kind of just one day at a time. Biting it off into those doable chunk sizes, isn't it? And mentally, that makes a difference, like not focusing on the vast distance in between. I just got to get to here. I remember actually when I very, very, very first started riding a bike again as an adult, I think it was, (laughs) how old would it have been, maybe 20, 21, and someone at work was talking to me about riding and he said, the biggest thing that I was told like when I'm on a hill climb is sometimes just look at the tyre, not the hill. And then someone else once told me, when you're riding and it's a struggle, all you got to do is get to the next indicator pole on the on the road. Just focus. I can just get to that. I can just get to that. And I can't tell you. Now, I love the landscapes I ride in and I can't say I, I look at my tyres and not my surroundings when I'm going up an amazing climb here in the Pyrenees. But there are times where I do just focus on the next little small landmark on the horizon. And that's a similar sort of thing, really, isn't it? Yeah, indeed. And 
those days that were um, a little bit hillier, it was interesting because when you're cycling and it's nighttime, you can't see the hill that's in front of you. You just realise that your um, gradient has changed and you're just riding uphill now. And you, it doesn't, you don't have the mental battle that, oh my God, look at that in the distance. I've got to get up that. You're just, you're just on it. And you do miss out on the landscape that is surrounding it, but you get that back in spades once the sun comes up and you get the sunrise and everything else. So it was, again, a little bit part of my mental strategy that those mornings didn't seem as hard. (laughs) Another blessing of getting away from the headwind by setting off in the dark in the early hours of the morning. Mm. Yeah. Gosh, Emma, I could chat to you for hours about this because I know there's so many details I've just totally skipped over, but I can't. I've got two questions that I ask all my guests and you'll, you'll probably know what they are. And I wonder actually during the ride whether, whether your answers to these changed at all. So the first one, whoa, do I know the answer to this one? I feel I do, but maybe I'm wrong. Okay, you're going to be cycling all day and on this designated day you get to choose do you cycle up a constant climb all day or battle into a constant headwind? Which one are you going to choose? Having listened to a few of your podcasts while I was on my journey, I, I'm certainly familiar with the question, Bella. Um, but it, it, I think it's changed. Like my, my answer has definitely changed at different points. But for me, I, ultimately, I think it's the headwind. And the realisation was coming through the ride that, you know, the wind is such a bigger part of everything. It's, it's not me against the wind. The wind is driving the windmills, turning them to get the water, seeing the birds in the thermals above me, knowing that there's a much bigger picture at play and I'm just this little little speck on a bike. And, hey, it's good resistance training at the end of the day, is it not? <laughs> I really appreciate your reasons as to why you chose the headwind too. No one has ever phrased it in that way, that using the wind as a driving force for good things as well. It's not just something that's against Yeah, it's actually having a positive impact and we need it as well. The resistance training is not lost on me. (laughs) Or anyone that experiences headwind on a regular basis. And I must say, just anecdotally, I did have the realisation that you would have had the headwind and the hill at the same time, especially coming into that last day getting home. (laughs) Because you had the easterly and you're in the... (laughs) <laughs> that beautiful hilly terrain we were talking about with the hinterland and the, and the sunny coast. Oh, yeah, that's coming in hard. Yeah. Okay, so my, my last question for you then, Emma, it is you have the choice, you're cycling for four hours. Will you choose to cycle for four hours on your own or would you rather cycle for four hours with other people? If it's a recharge day, it would be cycling with me. <laughs> but if it's not, I love the company of others. I just had the best weekend doing the the Brisbane to Gold Coast 100 kilometer cycle and there's 5,000 riders in that event and being able to do it with five of my really close friends made it so easy. I'm like well that was 100k it's finished already oh my gosh. (laughs) Probably not being fully loaded and on a gravel bike with wide tires also helped however yeah it was really nice to have some company makes the time go probably a lot quicker but then I have a a much greater appreciation for spending time on my own on a bike as well especially now so I'm I'm kind of both I am sorry I'm trying to think of whether I need to push you up the fence or not uh I I just don't want to be that mean person so I'm going to let you sit there and take in the sunset view (laughs) (laughs) Uh, look I'll I'll pick my own I'll I'll choose my own adventure it's just me then yeah your own adventure cool and who knows maybe you're going to chat to a stranger along the way exactly if that's allowed (laughs) it it totally is allowed it totally is allowed so emma if people want to actually learn more about the details that uh, we didn't go into for this trip you did mention you did actually put daily posts up on your own facebook group didn't you yeah, I had a lot of trouble creating that Facebook group. So it's it's not actually a group, it's just a page, which means that people couldn't post onto it. Uh, so I realized my error in the social media world. And I uh, sadly don't really have Instagram. So the Facebook page where I blogged it, I guess, is called Alice to Alex. And it's a number two in the middle. No worries. I will definitely be providing a link to that in our show notes so our listeners can have a look and at the beautiful images that you shared on there, but also maybe like me have a 
beautiful smile at watching those videos as well. <laughs> I, I think my favourite one is definitely the emus. You did have one where you were coming across the path of a bull that just did not want to move. He was a yeah. big fella. <laughs> he was huge. And, yeah, I, I had no hope. He was not fast, but I, I did insult him. I think I was calling him a cow and he was absolutely a bull. <laughs> yeah, there was definitely a significant thing that showed bull to me. <laughs> Well, Emma, it has been an absolute pleasure. I have really, really enjoyed this yarn with you today. I have loved our discussion so, so much. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure to to meet you and yarn with you. Hopefully we can do it by a campfire one day. I will definitely, I'm virtually shaking your hand, pinky yep. promise, I will, I will yep. make that happen. I would love to I'll make that happen. Awesome. Oh, done. Sorted. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Sounds great. I feel so energised having just listened to Emma share her story about that beautiful trip she took right from the centre of Australia down there through to the Sunshine Coast, visiting places that were important to her, but also as an Australian, just hearing her talk about and recount the scenery of the typical Aussie landscape just absolutely beautiful and bringing back some beautiful memories for me as well. Now, if you've got your own story about a bicycle adventure that you would like to share with our listeners, please get in touch. Send me an email. The email address is podcast at seektravelride.com and we can talk about how you too can be interviewed as a guest for the show. Until the next episode, my name's Bella Malloy. Thanks for listening.